Welcome back to another edition of Pony Fans Live. Pony Fans Live is brought to you by Lakewood's First and Ten, located at the northeast corner of Mockingbird and Abrams in Dallas, uh, and recently was named Best Sports Bar in Dallas by D Magazine. Also brought to you by Game Day Cloth, love your team, love your clothes. Visit their store at the corner of Legacy and the Tollway in Plano, or visit gamedaycloth.com. And make sure to check out their grand opening, which is going to be Friday, September 10th. Again, at the corner of Legacy and the Tollway in Plano. And also brought to you by PonyFans.com, the oldest and largest and only free website covering SMU athletics. This is the final preseason PonyFans live show, starting in the week after the Texas Tech game. It'll be going to a weekly format every week here at Lakewood's First and Ten, so we invite you to join us each and every week. With that said, please help me welcome our guest tonight, uh, the mastermind behind the SMU secondary, which took a big leap last year, uh, more than doubling the number of interceptions from the year before, SMU secondary coach Derek Odom. And on my left, your right, a three-time All-Southwest Conference pick, first-team All-American in 1983, the 10th overall pick in the first round of the 1984 draft by the New York Jets, and still the all-time record holder for interceptions by an SMU player, Russell Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're going to start with you, Russell. Catch us up a little. Since you retired and since you've, uh, you're now living in McKinney, what are you doing now? Uh, right now, I'm a flight attendant actually for Southwest Airlines. Been working with them for five years and have uh, four kids. Uh, my oldest son just graduated from Stanford University the 13th of June. I have a daughter that goes to the University of New Orleans and I have a seven and uh, three year old at home. All right, so Texas prides itself on the amount of football talent that comes out of here. How does SMU find a defensive back in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and convince you to come down to Cowboys country and play college football for SMU? Well, uh, at that time, I was also running track, and uh, SMU had a pretty good track team. And they were the, like one of the only schools that didn't make you go to spring practice if you did run track. So we had around 10 guys on the track team that also played football. So once football was over, we could run track. So that was a big selling point. I've seen you out at some practices this preseason. Do you get the itch at this time of year to still get out there and strap on the pads and hit somebody and run around and sweat? No, the only itch I get is just to look at it, you know. <laughs> I mean, I like watching the young kids play. I like to see them play hard, and hopefully SMU can keep up the success that they had last year. All right, so it's been a few years since you've been through two-a-days. Yes. What were the worst parts, the hardest parts to get through besides just the pure heat of being out there? Well, back then we were very physical, so all our uh, drills and practices were very physical. So, I mean, you had to be ready to hit every day, in which we did. It made us a lot better, though. Okay, and then when you got drafted by the Jets, mm -hmm. it's no longer something you're doing after class. This is now your full-time job. Tell us a little about the differences between SMU preseason workouts and practices and what you faced once you became a professional and we're doing this for a living. Well, I, th I think when you go to the next level, it's a lot of mental that has to go on. You know, mistakes get you kicked cut quickly. You know, everybody uh, is physical, everybody can run, but uh, mistakes is what kills you. So you try to limit yourself on the mistakes you make and. Uh, go hard every play. Okay, at SMU you played both cornerback and safety. You had the size to play safety, you had the speed to play corner. Leading up to the draft in 84, were there any teams that were talking to you about drafting you as a corner or did you know you were gonna be a safety at the next level? Well, actually I played both in the pros. I played corner and safety. So uh, when I came out of SMU my senior year, I was playing free safety, but uh, most of the team, because I could run, were uh, looking at me as corner at that time. And as uh, my career progressed in the pros, 
got a little bit bigger, I moved inside. Did you prefer one or the other? Or was it wherever the coach tells you, that's well, where you're ready to go line up? Much rather play safety because you're more involved in the game. You can do a little bit more things. Um, you watch a practice of a June Jones coach team. Some of his guys are here tonight, members of the, of the secondary for this year. But you watch his, his team practice, and they don't hit a whole lot, like almost at all, really. And I know you commented on that at practice the other day. How would that have gone over with you and your teammates if uh, you came out to practice and you had that kind of a dynamic worked into it where you weren't going to be pounding each other every day? Well, I think just back then it was our coaches, Steve Sidwell and uh, Bill Kay were our defensive coordinators. And I think we had enough people to hit every day. So it might be a little bit different. We, when, when you have numbers, you can do it. If you don't have the numbers, it's hard to hit every day. So I think we were in the process of getting good, so we were also weeding out players at that time. So it was easier to hit, and you would see who could hit, who couldn't hit, and who could take it, who couldn't take it. They would leave the team, and you know, you get the best people left. Did, that, uh, did you ever go to teammates or coaches and, I don't know if you say back off a little bit, but how, how did you reach an understanding of how much you could hit to prove your toughness, to earn your playing time without killing each other at practice every day? Well, I think at that time, we weren't killing each other, we were killing the scout team. So it <laughs> just made a little bit different. It, it got everybody better. We had actually wide receivers running the route for us instead of defensive backs, and running backs were actually running the ball. So it made them better and made us better. So we weren't really beating up on each other. All right, for those who don't remember, or weren't here at the time, you played on a 1982 team that went 11-0-1. You were the only undefeated team in the country. You beat Pittsburgh in the Cotton Bowl, keeping an offense led by Dan Marino without a touchdown. Yet somehow Penn State gets named national champion. Was that a sympathy vote for uh, Penn State because they thought Paterno was going to retire 25 years ago? Well, I think at that time, we didn't have the name as Penn State. In you know, when you don't have that name and you have a lot of people voting that don't know you, it makes it hard. All right, and on the way to that Cotton Bowl, the one blemish on your record was a tie against Arkansas in the Cotton Bowl. Um, you were pretty responsible for keeping that game a tie with a key field goal block. Tell us what you remember about that play and about that game and, and sort of the emotions afterward where you hadn't lost, but they call what do they call it, kissing your sister when you tie? Yes. Well, you know, the game was going tight game. Arkansas was very good at that time. And uh, I just remember, like, their first touchdown, I just missed the extra point. And we were going in, and they were coming in to score, and I just got a good jump on the ball and ended up blocking it uh, to help us tie the game, keep the game tied. Okay, now, the team, that, uh, the team that you beat in the Cotton Bowl from your home state. Right. The team that had the national championship gift wrapped to them right. was from your home state. Yes. Do you remember after that Cotton Bowl when the polls came out, did you take that harder than the other guys on your team since you were a Pennsylvania native? Well, it was funny. When I was coming to SMU, it just boiled down between the University of Pittsburgh and SMU. And uh, I knew Dan, I knew all the wide receivers on the team. So it was, it was sweet for us to beat them. I mean, I had all my friends at home. They were all wearing SMU jerseys and, you know, up on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, that's kind of unheard of. And it was kind of bittersweet that uh, we didn't win the national championship, but I think everybody in my area knew that we were the better team. Okay, I was going to ask, you knew all the guys on those teams because yes. you played with them in high school or played against them. Yes. Had SMU played Penn State that year, how would that game have come out? I think at that time, any school on the East Coast, we wouldn't really have any trouble with them. I just speed. Our, our team was so fast and defense was so aggressive. They, they played like a more of a plotting type style. And it just shows to show you when we played Pitt, they had one of the best high scoring offenses in football, in college football at that time. And we shut down all their wide receivers. I think our speed was a big advantage for us. Okay, that, that team that you were on was pretty loaded. Obviously, the headliners were Eric Dickerson and Craig James and people like that. Yeah. But 
try to p paint a picture for those of us who weren't there at that game or during that year, just how talented that team was and how it would stack up against some of the better teams that have been playing since then. Well, we had Michael Carter and Jerry Ball and Rod Jones and Wes Hopkins. I mean, we had, uh, I would say, Reggie Phillips, four or five first round draft pick defensive backs in the three years that we were there. So I think we could stand up with anybody. I was going to say, you mentioned some of the guys you played with. Michael Carter, John Simmons, Rod Jones, Harvey Armstrong. Yes. And while Mitch all the Willis. attention went to, yeah, exactly. Yes. And while all the attention went to Eric Dickerson, and right. rightly so, he's obviously yeah. a great player. Can't take anything away At from one him. point, you had nine starters on your defense who made it to the NFL. Yes. Has there ever been a team that's done that? And did you get overshadowed by, unfairly overshadowed by your own offense? I think now the only team might be uh, Florida that I could think would have that many. But, uh, we actually played to be good. And you know, even though they were getting the Pony Express rightly slow, they should have all the, all the headlines because our offense gets the headlines, but we thought we were pretty good too. So who were the, the personalities on your defense that were getting some of the attention as well between you and Michael Carter? Was there a, I mean, a push to get more press and attention for you guys as well? No, I, I think basically we just played to win. And I mean, when one person does good and when the whole defense gets good, then everybody gets the accolades. So, you know, as a team, we just want to go out and shut anybody down as good as possible. Okay, some of your old teammates have been around campus more in recent years. Seen you at practice, seen Reggie Dupart at practice, Craig James has been around, Eric Dickerson's been around. Is that something where Coach Jones and his staff have reached out to you guys, or is this you all as, as friends saying, let's get back together and let's get back involved with the school some more? Well, I think with the success that SMU's having, and they haven't been successful in such a long time that we all have a special place in our heart for SMU. And whatever we can do to help them out and be there, or whatever, I think we're all willing to do. Okay, you, you got to a handful of games last year. Yes. What were your impressions of, of the defense and specifically of the secondary last year from what you remember? Well, I thought everybody ran to the ball and played hard. I mean, that's the key to defense. I mean, you make mistakes, and, but if everybody's hustling, everybody's running to the ball, everybody keeps their head up, then you usually end up pretty good. And that's what I saw last year. I mean, nobody hung their head. I saw them down a couple times, and they come back, and, you know, somebody always came up with a big play, and that's what you need. You talked a little bit about the incredible speed that you had all the way across that defense. But the offenses that you faced were a lot different than what they're running out there today. Almost everyone yes. runs some formation of a spread offense. Yes. How would your, de your defense have stacked up? Did you have enough depth that you could have rolled out enough DBs over and over again to chase receivers all over the field? Yeah. We, like I said, Roderick Jones was a first round pick and he didn't start for us. So I'm sure we had some guys behind everybody that we were able to play. Yeah, yeah clearly, mm -hmm. clearly. All right, we're going to take a break. Um, Russell Carter, Derek Odom are our guests. We'll be back in just a minute with a little more Pony Fans Live. All right. Your turn. Right. 